All right, so I, I've been tasked to uh, talk about when to use iliac fixation in the setting of MIS posterior procedures. And really the, the indications for using iliac fixation, um, I don't think are really, uh, there's a difference between MIS or open procedures. And so um, the objectives really are to compare the techniques and indications of the S2AI screws versus iliac screws, and then describe you know, when to place pelvic screws, and then kind of illustrate um, how the SI joint sort of um, is affected by pelvic screws um, and, you know, when to think about fusing the SI joint. So, you know, why do we care? Why did pelvic fixation, you know, start off? Um, so when you look at the literature in the early 2000s and mid 2000s, these case reports and these case series came out talking about early fractures of the sacrum and pelvis following longer constructs. And um, it, it uh, you know, as we kind of moved into uh, performing more um, adult degenerative scoliosis stuff and longer constructs, we started getting these complications. Um, and here's an example. Um, this is a patient that came to me a long time ago, um, had a long construct. And the, you know, you can see on the, the image, um, the sagittal um, uh, or the lateral views show that the S1 screws have pulled out but more detrimental to the patient is that the sagittal imbalance is a direct cause of the sacral fracture. So to fix this, um, I ended up having to do a, a sacral osteotomy. So this is not an easy thing to fix. Um, this patient came to me late and, you know, it was, it was a bit of a challenge to fix. So this is kind of what, you know, why pelvic fixation was, um, you know, we started to use it. From a biomechanical perspective, the, um, when you look at this, this is a nice paper by uh, Cunningham and McAfee. Uh, and what they did is they, they instrumented uh, cadavers from you know, L5 up to L1, and they looked at the uh, strain on the S S1 screws. So the strain on the S1 screws goes up as the construct becomes longer. And at L3, there's a significant difference between the reduction of uh, strain on the screws when you put in pelvic fixation, in this case, iliac screws, and also reduction of strain with um, a femoral ring allograft. This is also borne out by um, the study by Gary Fleischer, who is one of our fellows, and, and Dr. Bawachi, again, looking at iliac fixation, a lifts and, and versus pedicle screws, and significant reduction in the uh, S1 screw strain across all uh, all aspects of motion. Um, and so, you know, the indications for pelvic fixation, um, there's a few of them. So one we've already talked about, which is prevention of a sacral fracture following a long construct and reducing S1 screw strain or loosening. Um, the other indications are uh, if you have sacral pathology, so a tumor, sacral insufficiency fracture, and you wanna bypass the sacrum and essentially connect the lumbar spine to the pelvis. Uh, another one would be to anchor. Um, you can use uh, pelvic fixation for an anchor um, when you're reducing a, a high grade spondy at L5S1. And then the other um, thing is fixation of uh, satellite rods or kickstand rods. And certainly, you know, that's becoming more common. So, um, and it comes, you know, you can do this in, in different flavors. There's single, you can use dual, um, unilateral, bilateral, and, and dual fixation, both um, iliac, iliac screws and S2AI screws. So here's an example of a, um, an older gentleman. He was 78, uh, prostate cancer, had an insufficiency fracture in, in his um, sacrum there was an attempt to fix it with SI joint fusion, which didn't work. And so I bypassed again, the sacrum with a dual bilateral iliac bolts and um, you know, his pain went away significantly um, and very quickly. So although it looks like a big construct, it, it's, it was a very effective treatment. And here's an example of um, using uh, both an iliac fixation and uh, uh, iliac bolts and an S2AI screw. Again, in a patient who had, um, you know, a degenerative scoliosis, she also had a sacral insufficiency fracture. And using the, um, the those kickstand rods to balance the pelvis to the spine was um, was really instrumental here uh, in getting the patient balanced. And here's the example of using S2AI screws as an anchor um, into the pelvis 
um, using a, the tea lift technique and uh, reducing that, um, that high-grade spondy uh, from a kyphotic angle into a, um, a lordotic angle. And, and that was very, very helpful having that, that foundation to work off of. So how do we do this? So the iliac fixation um, starts at the, the starting point is at the PSIS. And essentially you're going down the inner and the outer table. Um, I've done hundreds of these and don't use fluoroscopy for this. You can feel with the, with the all sort of the cancellous bone. And when you get to a, a hard point, you know you've, you've reached the cortex. Um, and it's a relatively simple uh, procedure to do. The downside is that the, these screws tend to be prominent and bone has to be removed. So in the setting of an MIS procedure, um, there's a little bit more work to do um, with an iliac screw. Whereas the SUAI screws, um, it's just distal to the S1 foramen, just a little bit lateral. Um, and again, your trajectory is uh, down the column, um, but you have to cross the SI joint and you're, sh and you're shooting just above the, um, um, the sciatic notch there. Uh, and, and you get really dense bone, uh, both above the sciatic notch, but also as you cross the uh, SI joint. And it's somewhat challenging because again, that palpation you get with the all, you have to cross multiple cortices and you, um, that brings into it a level of uncertainty about where it is and requires a lot of imaging to do it safely. Um, and he, here's an example of where the start point would be in, the, in panel A and the imaging, the fluoroscopy imaging that one would use to, to do this. Um, but you can get you know, uh, great fixation with this technique. And the nice thing is that it sits below the PSIS, sits below the iliac crest, and is um, non, um, you know, it's not really painful for the patient um, in contrast to the iliac fixation. Um, I, I personally don't use fluoroscopy, I use navigation, and navigation makes this, um, you know, a chip shot. It, you drill it, um, you tap it, and you put the screw in. But you, you know, you want the, it, it's ideal to put the screws in under power because the, the amount of insertional torque is significant. But in terms of biomechanics, if you looked at the iliac fixation versus S2AI screws, there's no real difference in the, the biomechanical um, uh, strength of either fixation. So it's kind of dealer's choice. But every good deed you know, um, goes, uh, gets punished, I guess, in the sense that with the um, fixation, the pelvic fixation, we get an increased rod strain and you get that primarily in inflection and also in compression. Um, and so that's something that you have to be aware of that you're increasing the stiffness of the, of the, um, uh, um, of the construct. And so that's gonna translate into something and obviously translate in part onto the, onto the rods. And again, here's a good example of a case that I have where you know, the rod broke distally. Um, not saying it's entirely the, the fault of putting in the SUAI screws, but I'm sure it, it, it contributes. So how does the SI joint kind of get affected by pelvic fixation? Well, when we think of the SI joint, we think of SI joint pain, and obviously there can be degenerative pathology, inflammatory arthropathies, but also this post-surgical or this adjacent level concept of how the SI joint is affected. And, you know, in thinking of the SI joint in pelvic fixation, you know, is there a reduction of broad strain when we, if we would, uh, were to fuse it, is there a reduction of SI joint motion and would it prevent post-op pain? So here's a, a, a paper that's kind of looking at SI joint pain after lumbar fusion, and they kind of um, defined SI joint pain by uh, using anesthetic blocks. And in this paper, the incidence of SI joint pain after a, a short construct without pelvic fixation was um, you know, quite high as in the, you know, about a third of their patients. Um, and here's an example of, of what the SI joint can look like um, in a patient that has had a long fusion without pelvic fixation. You see the vacuum phenomenon in the, uh, in the SI joint. And fusions without pelvic fixation certainly can increase the motion at the SI joint. Um, and so, you know, you go on, the patient had uh, SI joint pain and went on to have, a, uh, have, a, have an SI joint fusion bilaterally. But what's interesting is that is this paper where they looked at their group that had um, 
fusions with and without pelvic fixation. And the patients uh, with pelvic fixation, they actually, that's the, the P um, on the graph there um, on, the, on the far right, they, they actually had a very low incidence of patients with SI joint pain with pelvic uh, fixation. So that's, I, I found that pretty interesting. And so there's this concept that pelvic fixation actually may be preventative for SI joint pain. And if you look uh, biomechanically uh, at this, um, certainly bilateral, in this paper, they use bilateral iliac screws and bilateral iliac screws had the same reduction in motion as um, six um, uh, SI joint um, fusion devices. So you're, you're, you're dropping your, your uh, motion uh, at the SI joint significantly by just having pelvic fixation. But the one caveat there, um, and I'm trying to highlight it with this example, is that, that that was a biomechanical study. These screws still can loosen over time, especially in somebody with an osteoporosis. So it doesn't really tell the whole story in the sense that um, the iliac fixation or the S2I screws can loosen. And, and then that may also lead to um, SI joint pain if there's, if there's motion. That's what happened in this patient. The patient ended up um, getting SI joint fusion after their S2AI screws. Um, so in summary, you know, pelvic fixation is advised for longer constructs to prevent screw failure, but it does increase rod strain. Um, iliac versus S2AI screws off, offer similar reduction in strain on S1 screws. So it's kind of dealer's choice. The advantage of the S2AI screws is that it's lower profile. Um, and that SI joint pain is common post lumbar fusion uh, without pelvic fixation. And, you know, fusion remains kind of an option for treatment, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say you would outright uh, do it prophylactically. Um, thank you. Great, Shane. Uh, thank you very much for that great talk. Uh, you know, quick question, and maybe you touched upon this, but maybe you could expand upon it is like, are, are you a proponent for fusing the SI joint if you, if you have to go to ilium for fixation? Uh, it looked like you had put what well, looked like bedrock there in your last example um, uh, because of the concern for pain uh, in the long term. No, so I'm not a, so I've thought about that and I'm not a proponent of it. I, I don't think we have enough data to really determine whether it's the right thing to do. Certainly biomechanically, if you, you know, if you use pelvic fixation and you use kind of a bedrock device, there's no biomechanical advantage of the bedrock device. So the only advantage of the bedrock device would be to say, hey, I think my pelvic fixation is going to loosen over time. Therefore, I'm going to prophylactically fuse the SI joint so I don't get that motion at the SI joint down the road, which then can create pain. So, um, uh, so right now, no, I'm not, a, I'm not, I wouldn't advocate it yet, but I, I do think we need more information and data on that whole thing. Okay. Yeah, I, I know there's uh, currently a study ongoing, randomized prospective study, just evaluating that point specifically. So it'll be interesting to see what the data is, because having, um, I, I've done a handful of bedrock cases, maybe between five and 10, um, and it, it is a challenge sometimes to actually get bedrock uh, in. You have to plan uh, uh, sort of ahead in terms of where you're gonna put your S2AIs, you have to modify it a bit, and patient's pelvic anatomy certainly is an issue. So it, it's, not a, it's not an easy um, to add a, a fusion, uh, and so it, it need to have a, a clinical benefit from it. Yeah, um, I, you know, I think with a lot of this stuff, um, especially the S2AI screws, like navigation, um, you know, makes it so much easier. Um, and I, I'm a huge proponent of, of navigation for, you know, with this stuff. Uh, so Dr. Birch, on the same note, uh, do you, when you do your S2AI screws and you see the uh, SI joint there, do you arthrodesic it while you're there and put graft in it or no? No, no, I um, bypass it. Um, essentially, I think bypassing it offloads the SI joint. It prevents the increased range of motion you get if it's, you know, without the pelvic fixation. And I think that's sufficient. I don't have a lot of patients, honestly, with post, post op um, SI joint pain. Um, so. You know, it looks like um, Dr. Lieberman actually has a question. 
just uh, just wanted to make a comment, Shane. Great, great talk. Uh, wanted to emphasize one point: a, a general principle of orthopedics when you're fusing anything is always getting two points of fixation. So what makes us think that just putting one screw across the SI joint is going to really fuse it? It just doesn't work. And as I've evolved, yes, I do. When I do an open SI joint fusion, I do decorticate that for all my long constructs and pack the SI joint with bone and then try to get two screws across. So I've been using a lot of S1 aleriliac and S2 two aleriliac screws. And as Paul pointed out, the pelvic anatomy is so crowded in, in the sacral ala and the iliac wing, and, and you're looking for that teardrop notch, uh, that it's sometimes very hard to get the granite device and an S1 and an S2 screw in that little space. So you do have to be creative uh, when you're doing it. And this is where uh, I'm a big proponent of the preoperative planning. So before you even get into the operating room, you know exactly what you can fit in there and, and how you what the configuration is going to be to optimize the fixation and optimize the fusion. Yeah, Izzy, I, I, I agree. I mean, you know, as you know, the, um, the anatomy can change from one side to the other. You know, it, you might have one um, side of the patient that is uh, quite amenable to a lot of stuff. And then the other side is much more challenging to fit all that stuff in. Absolutely. So, um, Izzy, you bring up a, actually a great point, and I know we're a little bit behind, but I think it's important. It, how, how do you decorticate that side joint? I find it a bit of a challenge, and uh, this may go to you pre-operative planning, maybe using utilizing a robot or, or navigation even, because, the, you know, getting adequate decortication of the SI joint is, is um, not easy. No, no, it's absolutely difficult work, and it's all on the basis of the exposure ahead of time. So if I'm doing this, I, I, if I'm fixing to the pelvis, I'm not doing a minimally invasive procedure here. So I do expose the SI joint. I do resect the dorsal sacroiliac joint ligaments, and they are very tough, thick, tenacious ligaments. You get right down into the joint, uh, and then it's a combination of curettes and a high-speed burr. And I try to get down at least a centimeter depth into the joint. Uh, till I see some bleeding cancellous bone that, that's coming up there. And then as I proceed with the rest of the case, I will then go on and um, put some flow seal or pack some Surgicel or something into that SI joint to stem the bleeding for the rest of the case, and then come back at the end of the case and pack it filled with bone graft. 